It's good to have everyone tuned in with us for another lesson for Sunday morning worship here at the Hope Street Congregation. For those of you who are tuned in, we have a drive-in worship service each Sunday morning at 9 a.m. We'd love for you to come out and be with us as we have a full-fledged service each Sunday morning in our parking lot, a drive-in service, so we'd love for you to come out and be with us at that time. We also have other lessons here on YouTube, and we hope and trust that you'll tune into them as well. If you have your Bible with you today, I want you to turn with me to the book of Acts. The chapter is 1, Acts chapter 1. Beginning at verse number one, Acts one and verse one, where the Bible reads, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, the book of Acts is actually a continuation of the book of Luke. Luke had written to this dignitary, Theophilus, a man of high rank, when we look in the book of Luke, the chapter is 1. If we'll go back with me to Luke, the chapter is 1, uh, beginning at verse number 1, Luke 1 and verse number 1. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having have a perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. So Luke wrote to Theophilus when we see the book of Luke, and when he writes the book of Acts, we see him writing again to Theophilus concerning the things that Jesus had done. But our focus for the next several lessons will be on verse number three. To whom also he showed himself after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days. Now, this is the text in the scripture that tells us how long Jesus was with those apostles after his resurrection, before he ascended to heaven, he was with them for 40 days. But what we want to talk about is what he was speaking to them concerning. In Acts chapter 1, in the latter part of verse 3, it says, In speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, that's our subject matter. Things pertaining to to the kingdom of God. Now, first of all, Jesus is not talking to them about heaven itself in those 40 days. That's not the kingdom of God that he's talking about. We're going to differentiate that kingdom from the one that Jesus is talking about as we see here in Acts 1 and verse number 3. Now, the kingdom that Jesus is talking about in Acts 1 and 3 is the church. The church is the kingdom of God. Now, we're going to look at uh, dispensationalism, and we're going to look at premillennialism, and we are going to eradicate that myth because the Bible does not teach that Jesus is coming back to sit upon a literal throne of David for a thousand years. We're going to show unequivocally that that cannot be true from the vantage point of the scripture. First of all, we need to identify the kingdom. I want you to go with me in your Bible to Matthew, the 16th chapter. Matthew chapter 16. 
When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Pie, Matthew, Matthew 16, 13, he asked the disciples, saying, Who do men say that I the son of man am? They said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, so one of the prophets. And he said that I am, but whom say ye that I am? Simon Peterson said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now let's look at this text. In Matthew 16 and verse number 18, Jesus says he was going to build his church upon that confession that Peter made that he was the Christ, the Son of God. In verse 19, he says, I will give thee the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, the Lord did not intend to build one institution and then give keys to something entirely different. I'm going to say that again. Jesus did not intend to build one institution then give keys to something that was entirely different. So what is your point, preacher? The kingdom and the church are the same institution. The institution that Jesus was going to build upon the confession that Peter made that he was the Christ, the church, is the same institution that Jesus gave Peter the keys or the authority to open in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost, as we will see as the lesson progresses. So we see in Matthew 16, 18, and 19 that the church and the kingdom are one institution in the same. Once again, Jesus did not build one institution and they'll give Peter the keys to another totally different institution that doesn't even make walking around sense, my friend. So the Lord identifies the church as the kingdom. Turn with me in your Bible to the book of Luke. The chapter is 22. We look at the Passover or the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples. Luke chapter 22. Let's begin together at verse number 13. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made them ready for the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him and he said unto them, with desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. This is before his crucifixion. For I say unto you, I will not eat any more, uh, eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now Jesus is not talking about heaven himself, itself in this text, and we're going to prove that. He says, I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So there's going to be the supper again, but it's going to be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Notice in verse number 17, and he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. Notice verse 18. Luke 22, verse 18. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Now get that. Jesus says, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Now we've already established the fact that the church, we've identified the church as the kingdom, the same institution and now, Jesus says, he would not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God 
shall come. Let's go to Hebrews. The chapter is 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And I want you to put a bookmark there. Hebrews chapter 12. And we're going to go back to clarify something further as we just read in Luke 22. To show that he said that we would, he would drink it new when the kingdom shall come. So now I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 12 and put your bookmark in Hebrews chapter 12 because we're going to go there just briefly. Mark that for me. Now I want you to go to 1 Corinthians. The chapter is 1. 1 Corinthians, the chapter is 1. Verses 1 and 2. Now we've established, Jesus has established for us that the church and the kingdom, they're one in the same institution. Now, when Paul writes to the, the saints at Corinth, he writes, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 1 and 2. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Now he writes to the church of God, which is at Corinth. All right? Now we've established that the church is the kingdom. And Jesus says that he would not drink of it new until the kingdom should come. That was the Lord's Supper. Well, Go with me to 1 Corinthians, the chapter is 11, and let's see what happened in the church at Corinth, which is the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, and verse number 20. When ye, now Paul was reprimanding them for not partaking of the Lord's Supper in an appropriate manner. But they were partaking of the supper in the church at Corinth. And they were not to take of the supper until the kingdom would come. So now we establish something. The church of God at Corinth partook of the Lord's supper. But the Lord's supper would not be partaken of until the kingdom of God would come. Guess what, my friend? The kingdom had to be in existence because they were partaking of the Lord's Supper. Notice, if you will, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 20. When you come together, therefore, in one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. But in eating, every one of you taking his own supper. One is hungry, another is drunken. What? Have you not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise ye the church of God? And shame them not that have not. What shall I say unto you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Then he goes on to tell. For I received of the Lord. That which also I have delivered unto you. The same night in which he was betrayed. He took bread. Remember we just read about that. And when he had given thanks he said. Take eat this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me, after the same manner he also took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new testament in my blood. This do as oft as you drink in remembrance of me. They were partaking of the supper in the church at Corinth, and the supper would be partaken of when the kingdom of God would come. Therefore, the kingdom of God had come. Because the kingdom of God is the church, and they were partaking of the Lord's Supper in the church, which is the kingdom. Let's get some further proof. I told you to mark Hebrews chapter 12. Let's go there together. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews, the 12th chapter. And let's listen to what the Hebrew writer says here. Hebrews, the chapter is 12, and verse number 23. Hebrews 12, verse 23. Notice what the Hebrew writer calls the church. He says, 
in verse number 23 of Hebrews chapter 12, he says, uh, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and the spirits of just men made perfect. Now, as we keep reading, in the same context, notice verse 28 and 29. We're in the same context. Now, he calls it the church of the firstborn in Hebrews 12 and 23. Now, he says in verse 28 concerning the church, wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us by grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and fear, for our God is a consuming fire. What do we establish here? In verse 23, it's the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. In verse 29, 28, it's the kingdom that they received. Once again, my friend, the church and the kingdom are the same institution. Thus, the kingdom is identified as the church. Now, when we read our New Testament, the New Testament church of our Lord is, is set aside in, in various ways. Now, I want to look at a few here. First of all, the church is the body of Christ. Uh, to bring that point out, I want you to turn me to Ephesians. The chapter is 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. And, and, and these designations are there for a purpose because the Lord wants us to know something by way of the designation. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all and all. So the Lord lets us know that the church is the body. So what, what do we have when we have the body? Because the church is the body, there should be cohesiveness in the church. It should exist. That's why when Paul talks about the cohesiveness of the church, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, turn that with me if you will, 1 Corinthians 12, he talks about the human body relative to the body of Christ and how there should be cohesiveness in the body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 12. For as the body is one, that's the church, and it has many members. So there are many members in the church. And all the members of that one body so there are many members in one body. Being many are one body, so also is Christ. Now there, he says in verse 13, for by one spirit were you all baptized in the one body, whether you be Jews or Gentiles, whether you be born or free, having made all to drink into one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. But there's one body with many members, and it should be cohesive, why? Notice verse 15. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body, it is therefore not of the body. And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, am I not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, then where were the hearing? If the whole were a hearing, where were the smelling? But now God has set the members, every one of them in the body as it has pleased him, and if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, but yet one body. Paul gets us to see the cohesiveness of the body, and there should be no division or schism in the body. Notice verse 25, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. So the New Testament sets aside the church as the body of Christ. Now in 1 Corinthians, the chap I mean 1 Timothy, the chapters 3, turn there with me if you will, he calls the church the house 
of God. Oh, it's the family of God. First Corinthians, I mean, First Timothy, chapter 3, and verse number 15. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. So the church is the house of God or it's the family of God. Now the emphasis there is said that in a family that love should exist among the brothers and the sisters in the body or in the house of God because they are family. Look at Acts, the chapter is 20. Acts, the 20th chapter, and let's look at another designation of the church in the New Testament. Acts, the chapter is 20. Now, Paul writes, and he gets writes to the Ephesian elders, and he writes to them, and he lets them know uh, in verse number 28, uh, verse number 27 and 28, for I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. Verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. Now, it's called a flock. Over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. So we see the church and the members of the body as a flock or sheep who follow the shepherds. And we see the importance of eldership in the kingdom of God. Now, the church also is designated as the kingdom. We've already established that. And what do we find? The government of this divine institution, the church, the kingdom, now is spoken of in two different ways ways as we look at the New Testament. First of all, we have the church universal, the entire church. All the members of the body of Christ, of the church of Christ, all of the world are the universal church. Hence, in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. So he didn't have a specific location in mind when he said that because he was speaking of the church universal. Now, the church is also spoken of in the congregational or the local sense. All of the local congregations of the Lord's church make up the church universal. Remember when we read 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 2? To the church of God, where? Which is at Corinth. Let me give you another example. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians. The chapter is 1, when Paul opened his letter up uh, to the Thessalonian Christians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let's look at this together in verse number 3. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. In verse 1, I'm sorry. Paul and Silvanus, or, 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 or Silas, and to Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he writes to the church of the Thessalonians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse number 2, we have a location, Corinth. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, in verse 1, we have a location, Thessalonica. Now, I want you to notice something. Go with me to the book of Revelation, and I'm going to give you these verses. I'm not going to go into the Bible and get them all. I've already been there for you just to show you where we have the seven churches of Asia. When John writes his letter uh, from Patmos, and the Lord speaks something concerning every one of those local congregations. When we read the Revelation of John, in Revelation chapter 2, in verse 1, he writes to the church at Ephesus. In Revelation 2, in verse number 8, he writes to the church of Smyrna. 
in Revelation 2 and verse number 12, he writes to the church at Pergamos. Now, what are we doing? Ephesus is a location. Smyrna is a location. Pergamos is a location. Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 18, he writes to the church of Thyatira. Revelation 3, 1, to the church at Sardis. Revelation 3, 7, to the church at Philadelphia. Revelation 3, 14, to the church of the Laodiceans. Notice, there is not a church in this Bible that's not named after a location. Now, we got churches all over the world named after something other than its locale or its location. The Bible doesn't teach that, my friend. We got all sorts of names for the church. But in the New Testament, churches were named after their location. So when we speak of the church universal, there's only one supreme ruler over that church. That's Jesus Christ is not the Pope in Rome. Because in Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. And as we read in Ephesians 1, and 3, 23, Jesus is the head of the body, the church. Now, we talked about he would not drink of the fruit of the vine until they drink it new in his father's kingdom. And it would have to come, and it did. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we find that kingdom that we're talking about as we're getting ready to partake of the Lord's Supper. But, friend, God wants you to be saved. And how can you do that? you got to hear that gospel, how he died and buried and resurrected for your sins. Believe it with all of your heart. Repent of your sins. Confess Christ as the Son of God. And be baptized for the remission of sin. And the Lord will add you to the kingdom, the church. And if you live faithful unto death, God will give you a crown of life. But we're here each Sunday to commemorate the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse number 23, Paul said, For I received of the Lord, that which also I have delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus in the same night which he betrayed took bread. And we begin at giving thanks. He break it and say it, Take, eat this in my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Let us give thanks for the bread. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this emblem, the bread, which represents the body, the perfect sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. For this we eternally grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the new testament in my blood. This do as oft as you drink in remembrance of me. For as oft as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of the cup of the Lord unworthy shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ultimate sacrifice of your son, Jesus, realizing that without the shedding of his blood, there would be no remission of sin as we partake of the fruit of the vine. May we always remember and be eternally grateful. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. And they sang a hymn, and they went out. Grace is eternal, Father God in heaven. We thank you for this another day. And we thank you for the greatest gift of all, the death, burial, and resurrection of your darling son, Jesus Christ, that we may have eternal life. In his name we do pray and ask it all. Amen.